So I'm going to talk today about predation, which is a field of research within electronic tracking and within the field of ecology that I'm really interested in. I really enjoy studying. Uh, it's work that's been funded in large part by the Research Council of Norway. I spent the last five years as a researcher at Norse uh, and, and at Nina as well in uh, Bergen and Trondheim. Uh, in January, I took a professor position at Dalhousie University, and now I'm with Ocean Tracking Network. And we have uh, uh, infrastructure all around the world, and we loan out uh, equipment, and we work with researchers to, to build a database and, and connect people. Uh, the team that I worked with in, in Norway was uh, pretty big, and a lot of the work that I'm going to present is from master's uh, research and PhD theses from students that I worked with. Uh, Knut Volset and I kind of worked to build all this up together over the years with a lot of collaborators as well, uh, Gustav included, as, as well as many others. And Ocean Tracking Network, just a, a sort of a, a brief overview of what it is. This is where I work now. Uh, it's a major science infrastructure in Canada, which is funded by the Canadian government. Uh, Ocean Tracking Network has uh, fixed infrastructure, so acoustic receivers, a lot of what Jordan talked about the, uh, this morning, uh, that we loan out and we, we make lines, uh, or we maintain lines in different parts of the world, especially in Canada. We collaborate with the European Tracking Network a lot. We maintain a database that uh, is filled up with detections from animal tracking uh, research all around the world. Uh, and we also run things like study halls where students from all around the world can drop in on Thursday afternoons and ask questions about their data, ask questions about study design. Um, everybody here is certainly welcome to engage with Ocean Tracking Network. We loan receivers all around the world. If you're doing studies and you want to add receivers to your study, you know, you know we have a loan application. If you want to send students that are working in this field, uh, or you just want to come drop in and, uh, and see what kind of data analysis people are doing, it's pretty easy to get a link. You can send me an email or uh, we can talk after and get a link uh, to the Zoom that, that happens every week. So we saw a lot of really cool talks about ecology, tracking animals, what they're doing, how they're living their lives, where they're going, the habitats that they're using, all the things we can learn about them. And ecology is, is of course, very much about life and what animals are doing and, and why and when and where, but it's, it's really also about death, the, the end of the life, and there's so much that we can learn, actually, from, from the end of the life of, of an animal. And I, I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Wrighton's presentation and seeing the, the images of the, the ends of the satellite tracks and, and where animals were dying, and he mentioned some of the predation that was really cool. And I think that with telemetry, we can find out not only if they die, because of course they do, all animals die, but we can start to learn and ask questions about how they die or why they die, uh, and also where and when they die, and start to look at patterns that, uh, that are occurring across the lifespan of animals. And we can use this to even uh, test a variety of hypotheses uh, about the lives of animals. This is an image of a, a pink salmon near the end of its life. These are, uh, unlike the Atlantic salmon that we have here, they're, uh, or that we have native here, the, the pink salmon are Samuel Paris, so the end of their lives coincides with their spawning, and this individual was caught in a net right before it uh, spawned, so it died at the, the last moment, really, probably before it was about to spawn. So uh, a lot of the work that I do on predation, one of the reasons that I've been really inspired to, to study uh, predation, it came from work that I did early in my PhD in, in some formative years when uh, I spent a couple months working on uh, recreational fisheries in French Polynesia. This is a bonefish, which is a really beautiful tropical flat species of fish. Uh, and they're highly vulnerable to predators. They live in, in areas where there's a lot of sharks on sand flats. Uh, we were fishing for them with, with some local guides in French Polynesia, and, and you could see the sharks kind of following you around. You could see them on the flats. They're you know, hundreds sometimes within, within your field of view. And we wanted to know how, how frequently fish that were caught by anglers in, in catch and release fisheries would be eaten by sharks. And we used a really primitive form of tracking where we, we attached a bobber uh, to the fish just as a short-term tracking method. In the shallow water, it worked quite well. Uh, and we could see that a lot of these fish were, were getting eaten by sharks after we were releasing them, and we started, really started to think about, you know, why are some individuals being eaten by sharks? Why are some surviving? What are the, what are the mechanisms at play here underlying these, uh, these relationships? And, and, and we found that the, the handling practices that we 
used in the fishing events made a difference. We could actually influence the fate of these animals by handling them even slightly better or slightly worse. You can see it's, it's pretty high predation probability, but this air exposure treatment with zero seconds had, had significantly higher survival in the first uh, uh, 15 minutes or so compared to fish that were air exposed for uh, 30 seconds or even only, only 10 seconds. So, so we, we could actually modify the individual's vulnerability to predation in these encounters. And, and this really spun up into all sorts of questions in my whole career that have, that have kind of followed me around. And I continue to try to get new, new research grants on this topic because I started to think about, you know, even if we're not interacting with animals, why, are, why and when and where are they vulnerable to predation in their natural lives? We could see bonefish on the flats, sharks swimming within meters of them and not eating them. But as, you know, as soon as we were catching them uh, by fishing, we were compromising them physiologically. We were making them slightly weak, slightly more visible, more vulnerable, uh, and it was completely changing the, the predator-prey relationship. So th this is a, a paper that I, it's one of my favorites in the field. I found it a few years ago. I thought this is information that would be really hard to ever actually know, but uh, the, the, this research group went through all the literature from uh, different taxa, and you'll see that fish are, are uh, unfortunately lacking here. But, but in general, they went through a lot of literature to see uh, how animals were dying. So what was the fate of animals from different studies? And, and they added them all up and, and predation, uh, plus you, you can look at these two harvest categories, legal harvest, illegal harvest, which are kind of a form of human predation. Those account for a huge amount of uh, the mortality of animals. You know, 75 to maybe 80%, say 70 to 80%. Uh, the vast majority of animals in the wild their lives will end because of predation, whether it's by a human or by another animal. So, so predation is really driving so much of what we see and so much of, of what actually happens in the wild. And, and the questions of who survives, uh, who doesn't, when are animals being eaten or where, is it happening before they're able to reproduce, is it happening after, these are all really important questions and, and really hard to answer, obviously. These are, you know, especially with fish, which is, presumably why they're lacking here. So predation is, is a major cause. It's highly visible. We all are, are familiar with predators. We're all, uh, you know, we've, we've seen it on, on TV and in the media. There's controversies around predators. Uh, there's uh, predators are often persecuted for the role that they have in the life cycle of animals. People don't like predators often. Uh, they're polarizing. Some people love predators. Some people dislike predators. It can depend on your worldview, your, the way you were raised, your perspective, rural versus urban perspectives. So there's the, the studying predation is, is challenging because of the, the social dynamics, but it's also very valuable because of the, the ecological role that they have. And, and there, there's some really amazing studies, actually. This is a, a picture, obviously, from, uh, whoopsies. This is a picture from when we were in French Polynesia and, and studying the bonefish and, and what happened to some of these fish. Uh, but there's some really great studies, actually, looking at the, the value of predation. So uh, the, the services provided by uh, wolves in Wisconsin, I think, in the United States, um, by, by reducing the deer population, they estimated a, a massive reduction in car collisions with economic consequences, essentially saving lives. Uh, estimates from cougars in the eastern United States could save over 100 lives uh, by reducing car crashes. Uh, and, and leopard predation uh, in India uh, on wild dogs or feral dogs that are transmitting diseases to people. Uh, has, it has you know, millions of dollars in value to the, the communities there. So is predation bad? It, really, it, it depends on your perspective, but there are very quantifiable, meaningful ways to understand, appreciate, and, and value the role of predators. And, and one of the ways that we can actually study predation now is, is animal tracking. So uh, it, it gives us the means with which to actually use the individual as a unit of rec replication and, a, and a, a, a unit of study. So we have, uh, oh, I'm going to hit the wrong thing here again. We have tags that we can implant into animals. There's a, a predator here, a spiny dogfish uh, with an acoustic receiver. 
These tags can have different sensors, so acceleration sensors, temperature sensors, depth sensors. And when the transmission gets logged onto the receiver, we get the date and the time. Uh, and, and using the same method as, as Jordan uh, demonstrated this morning with his very, very popular, very engaging simulation of the, of the tracking process, we can reconstruct the movement paths. We can reconstruct the depth like we saw from uh, Dr. Wright, and we can reconstruct temperature as well um, and acceleration. We can look at all sorts of different facets of the animal's life. And now we actually have these new predation sensors as well. So the tags can actually record instances of animals being eaten by predators, and that will transmit to the receiver. So when the, in, when the, when the animal, uh, this is a velvet belly lantern shark, if this animal is eaten uh, and it swims by the receiver, we'll get a new ID transmitted, and we'll see that that individual has been eaten. So mo movements, the, the study of animal movement and, and the ability to track movements gives us a ton of cool information about what animals are doing. This is uh, downtown Bergen, the, the harbor here. Uh, you can see the outlines from the backscatter imagery of the docks and everything. There's like a sunken boat in here somewhere. It's kind of cool, you can see. Uh, this is a pollock that we tagged. We have a high dimensional positioning system and we can see really, really fine scale movements uh, of the individuals. We can see hot spots of where they like. We can see sort of movement corridors uh, and we can start to, to calculate all sorts of cool movement metrics about it. We can also look at broad scale. This is a brown trout uh, outside of Bergen. So with the, the Vosso River here, uh, the fjord, Bergen is located right down here. There's that little harbor I was showing you. And we can see a, a trout that's been t uh, tracked not only in, in the fjord where we're working, but colleagues have sent us detections of this fish moving hundreds of kilometers away into a, a totally different fjord. And then we can also see the end of the life of a fish, which is, which is you know, it's, it's sad. You spend a lot of money and time, and, and you're excited to see this fish persisting well into the future. Uh, and you see this acceleration sensor giving you information that all of a sudden, after several weeks, a couple months, uh, the acceleration goes to zero, the tag is on the bottom, that fish has died, uh, and, and you, you're forced to, uh, to use these information to learn more about how, the, how, how animals end their lives, actually, in the wild. But what about predation? So this is a, a, a paper that we put out uh, earlier this year, uh, looking at how, how these tagging programs, how animal tagging and tracking can actually be used to study predation and answer questions that have really kind of plagued ecologists for a long time because it's really hard to observe predation. So the, the simplest way to do it is to neither tag the predator nor tag the prey. Uh, that is not very fun, it's not very interesting, you don't get very high quality data. Uh, you just sort of see animals that happen to have been eaten and you say, well, it, it ate something, I guess. It looks like it's a, uh, a bird or a bat or a bee or something. You can tag uh, the predator, but not the prey, and you can look at you can look for kill site clusters. Uh, you can have cameras on the collars of predators, or you can have cameras on the back of a shark and look at what it's eating. Uh, you don't really get individual data about the the prey. Um, you can tag the uh, the prey, but not the predator, and you can use these mortality sensors. You can use temperature sensors, as we saw from. Uh, from David Wrighton's work on the eels, where the, the, the temperature of the tag spikes up. Uh, it's indicating that it's inside something that is more homeothermic. Or you can tag both, and you can start to look at the interplay between the two species. Uh, how are they potentially interacting in space and time? Are they using the same areas? Are they, o are they overlapping? Uh, you can start to a answer more complicated uh, questions about predation. You can even potentially identify chases or attacks. Uh, you can identify, you can calculate the handling time, so the time that a, an individual predator takes to actually uh, consume a prey, and the, and and how much time uh, it'll take before it's ready to attack another animal. So here's a, an example of that first scenario. You don't tag the predator, you don't tag the prey. Uh, this brown trout was caught by an angler where we're uh, working. Uh, they sent us a picture and took out the stomach, and it was eating something that looks an awful lot like salmon smolts. Could be trout smolts, but it's almost definitely salmon smolts. So 
this individual wasn't tagged, these individuals weren't tagged. We've learned a little bit about the predation process. We've learned that they like to eat salmon smolts because they live in the same place. Salmon smolts are very energetically uh, uh, valuable and, the, and they're easy to catch clearly because the trout managed to do so. Uh, but we learned very little ultimately from this beyond the, the, the simple facts. Uh, in scenario two, we can tag the prey. So I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about these salmon smolts. Uh, oh, I hit the wrong thing again. These uh, Atlantic salmon smolts are uh, in rivers throughout Norway. They're obviously the Baltic salmon here in Sweden. Uh, we, where I work now in Canada, we have Atlantic salmon. They're a great species to study. Lots of fun, super cool, very interesting. Unfortunately, increasingly rare. Uh, challenging to study because a lot of rivers that historically were full of them are now disappearing uh, and, and more urgent that we actually study them and understand what's going on. We need to know more about the salmon, unfortunately, because uh, soon there's not going to be very many left. So we catch them in, in the rivers often by electrofishing. Uh, you can see Cecilia out here in, in a small river in western Norway. Uh, we implant the these very small transmitters into them. Uh, using surgical techniques, and then we let them go and, and track them down the river. This is where we're, uh, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, where we're working. So this, this is the Vaso River. Anybody heard of the Vaso River or familiar with Vaso? Here and there, it's a beautiful river. It's, it might be one of the most beautiful in the whole wide world. Uh, unfortunately, the salmon population there collapsed in the 1980s and really hasn't come back. It used to have one of the nicest salmon populations probably in, in the whole world. Frequently salmon, over 20 kilos captured there. Uh, you know, dozens of tons of salmon harvested uh, in commercial local fisheries in the uh, in the mid-century and, and all of a sudden just one year basically went to essentially nothing. Uh, the salmon have to migrate down through these lakes, which are quite challenging, through this fjord. They typically go the southern route around this island, out through here. This is Herdla with this little hook-shaped island and they go up through here all the way out to uh, up the Norwegian Sea to the Barents Sea, mostly, probably. Uh, but, the, but unfortunately, in recent years, it seems like they don't get very far. So we're trying to learn uh, a lot more about what's going on here. Interesting, I'll point out, there, there's a hydropower station that drains water from the mountains into this lake. So it's, it's hypolimnetic water coming from this cold lake. So it, it's actually cooling the river a little bit. Uh, and there's a lot of concerns locally that, that the hydropower station, the water discharge, there's no dam on the river. It's, it's literally just a giant tunnel of water that's, that's discharging down from the mountains. There's a lot of uh, concern that the temperature effects from that and the flow effects on the lake are affecting the migration. So that's, that's part of the motivation for, for studying this site. So tagged a lot of fish. I'm going to skip over a little bit of the, uh, the finer details and, and jump right into it. Here I've turned Vaso on its side, so you have to bear with me a little bit. The upper part of the river, the lake, the first lake here, the second part of the river, the lowermost lake where the power station discharges in, and then the lower part of the river, and then we get out to the fjord. And I've just kind of flattened this out so that we have one axis of, of space, which is longitude. Again, this is on its side, and then time. Uh, it's really hard to show three-dimensional plots, so you have to pick your two, your two preferred dimensions. Uh, and here we have one space and one time, uh, although you could argue that time is just space because time doesn't really exist. Um, so you can see there, there's, there's lots of individual movements within the lakes here. Uh, we have tons of receivers, so we see this one bouncing in between, probably dead. Uh, this is in a, a few, only a few really get out of that uppermost lake. One goes out and back in, it's a little curious. Um, and then in the lowermost lake, we again see a lot of movements at a fine scale within the lake, just between receivers. Uh, some of them move out. You see kind of a cluster in the timing of when fish are moving out, kind of between May 15th and and May 20th, May 17th is the national day in Norway, so it's some sort of, some sort of consistent celebration around, uh, around the salmon uh, in the river here. We have this late one too, which is kind of curious, coming out way, way after everybody else. Lots to learn in here. Uh, could be a whole other talk for another day. So y you can see that when you, when, you, when you look at what's going on here, there, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's happening. And when you know, uh, when you know that there's, there's uh, predators in the lake that are, have their bellies full of smolts, like we saw in that picture, 
you can imagine you start to become quite skeptical about what's going on in here. Who's actually a smolt? Who's actually in the belly of a trout? So we worked with a, a manufacturer to develop a new predation sensor for these tags that would actually be on board the tag and, and tell us what's going on inside the fish in real time as it's swimming around these receivers. And, and it's quite cool because it actually transmits the information from the tag to the receiver about the tilt of the animal. So the orient, the, I, I have a figure on it coming up, but uh, the, the tilt is basically a measurement of the position in space and the tag constantly updates itself to have uh, a zero value that's because the tag is going to shift a little bit inside the individual. So it's going to update to find the zero value as it's shifting a little bit. And deviations from that zero, zero value are going to be transmitted as tilt. And w we haven't done a ton of validation work, but this is from a tank experiment that we did where we uh, tagged some smolts and then we fed those smolts to trout. And because we needed to know how well the tags worked, otherwise all these values are essentially useless to us. Uh, and we could see that we see these, uh, these relatively low values, maybe up to about 60, 70, when the, ta when the tag is in the smolt. Uh, these yellow values, we, we feed the tag to the trout at the, at the line, and we see this little delay, but then we start to see these, these high values of tilt corresponding to the tag changing its ID and sending the information to us that it's, it's probably been eaten by a trout. And you can see that in these three different case examples, we see slightly different patterns. We see the, the characteristic spike here, but then we don't necessarily see the, the particularly high values here. Uh, and here we see a, the spike indicating that it's, it's been consumed, it's digesting, and eventually this is probably where it actually gets released by the animal back into the, the tag, either regurgitated or defecated, and it, it's rolling along the bottom probably of the tank, just going through all possible values of tilt. So, so you can see how much more value we get from these tags where we, we can see not only is it telling us, yes, I've changed my ID, I've probably been eaten, but also we're, we're sending the, I'm sending the tilt data so you can, you can validate and see what's actually going on under the hood. And, and, and this is a fish that we t released into the wild up here above the, the lake. And we see these are the tilt values that we get from the field. So again, very small tilt values, characteristic of what we see uh, for a smolt. All of a sudden, we get this spike. This, the ID changes. We get, again, small values, but the uh, tag has changed states. We get a big spike, and then it goes to zero, indicating it's just sitting on the bottom. Uh, and how, that how does that correspond to space? Here we have two axes of space instead of space and time. It's moving down. Right here, it gets eaten. The, the tag changes ID, but the, the trout or whatever ate it, well, it's definitely a trout because there's not much else in there, uh, moves down through the fjord until it drops the tag somewhere uh, in the fjord. So just a little uh, visual of how this works. All your phones will have an accelerometer in them just like this. Uh, if you're watching a movie and you flip your phone on its side, it knows it's on its side because the tilt value of your, t of your phone has registered that change in position and tilted your screen. And that's kind of the same way that these tags work. They measure position in space, and they transmit that position in space to you. Uh, so there's, there's three different dimensions that you can measure in theory for acceleration, uh, tilt, roll, and yaw. Uh, we're only looking at tilt, so going up and down like this. And these are, these are the smolts that we're using. Very, very beautiful, very fragile animals. And this is a, sort of an, another nicer visualization of how this is working. We get the tag tilt transmitted. Uh, these are field data, so the smolt is giving us these characteristic small values of tilt, indicating that it's relatively stable in the, in the uh, cavity of the fish. Smolt. Again, these are field data, so this is this is what we see on the receivers uh, when we get it back. We see this spike indicating that that something terrible has happened to the individual. That is what we infer from from this spike. The tag has changed its ID to uh, or the, which I've coded as red and we see these really high values. Presumably as the tag sort of rolls around, spiraling inside the stomach and digestive tract of the, tr of the trout, and then presumably it's dropped the tag 
it rolls around on the bottom a little bit until it finds its zero value. So pretty amazing quality of data to, to understand what's going on in a fish that is very vulnerable to predation, where you're worried when you're trying to make models and trying to understand what might be happening in this animal's life. Without these data, you, you're starting to make models based on both the, the fish that are your, your true data and their predators, which are, your false, uh, which are the false data. So when you're trying to model things like migration time, uh, you know, when are they leaving the river, how many are, the uh, how many are leaving the river, uh, you want to make sure that you're only modeling the smolts, or you're only modeling the fish or the species that you're interested in. You're excluding any data uh, that you're not interested in. So when we look back at these data, again, uh, bear with me. We have one axis of space, one axis of time. We're going down the river here. Lots of detections in the upper lake, lots of detections in the lower lake. I've changed individuals uh, that have been eaten to have a red code, a red color, and the black ones are the ones that maintain the smolt identity. So we have even fewer smolts exiting the lake. And when we cut off any data from predators, we start to get cleaner signals uh, of fish moving through these lakes. And how can, we, how can we use that? So one thing that we're really interested in here is, uh, so this is, this is an image of that lake uh, kind of from, from the, the sky. They're trying to migrate around here. The power station's coming down in here. Uh, interestingly, you can see the effects of the power station on the lake because this is a very cold winter and, and, and the area that has no ice is basically affected by the power station discharge. In summer, the water is colder than ambient, but in winter, it's a little bit warmer than it is ambient because of the, the turnover of the lake and the mountain. So you get this slightly warmer uh, water in the winter and it's keeping the ice off. So you, you can kind of actually detect the area that's of the lake that's influenced by the hydropower from this. Uh, this isn't when the smolts are migrating, it's just sort of a, a, a visualization. But this is the area that we're interested in. So uh, in order to infer the uh, influence of the flow from the power station, we're modeling the number of smolts that are passing through this area at different dates and times, so May, June, July, uh, and then we have different flows. So we have the flow from the river that's coming from upstream. It's the uh, spring flood is happening here at the end of May, around just after the 17th of May, uh, and then we have the power station discharge. And we actually had the power company turn off and on the power station so that we could uh, compare a uh, number of smolts migrating when the power station was on and off. Uh, and you can see that there, there's smolt migrating through this area pretty much at all times, a little bit of a, a peak when the, when the river floods, uh, but generally there, it wasn't actually correlated, uh, at least in this data series, with the timing when the power station was on or off. Similarly, we actually, we actually had the company make us combined predator and temperature tags because a big question became, are they getting a uh, temperature shock from being in this cold water area? And again, we, want, we, we wanted to say, okay, well, we're not really gonna know if we just use temperature tags, we're not really gonna know if we're measuring the temperature that the smolts are truly at, or if we're measuring the temperature that the, their predators are at, so we need a predator tag that also measures temperature so that once the fish is eaten, we can remove all of the temperature values from after that. And you can kind of see the effect. It, it probably wouldn't have a huge uh, influence on it, but you can see that uh, the red ones being uh, temperature readings from after predation. You can see that there are some times when you'd make some uh, slightly different, or you, your model would probably have uh, a little bit of variance associated with modeling the wrong species. So, so these tools are actually helping us make better models of what we're doing, of what we're, uh, of, of the conservation challenges that we're trying to resolve, uh, and, and we're using them in, in these contexts. But I think we can also learn a lot about the ecology of these animals simply from using the data that we get transmitted from these uh, tags. So we can ask questions like, when does predation occur? So we have the taggy data from three different years, 2021, 2022, brand new data from 2023. Nobody has ever seen this before, I guarantee you, because I just made it myself. The other, like yesterday or the day before, because so we just got the data downloaded. So you can see that in different years, you actually have different peaks in the timing of predation. These are density plots, uh, so they're, they're kind of scaleless uh, across years, but uh, 
when you sort of see the mode, it's the most common date of predation. Uh, here you have the dates that they were tagged. So you see there's a little bit of a difference in the tagging date. That was deliberate because we wanted to see if, uh, if the survival would be better later in the season because we hadn't really tested that before. Uh, but in general, you can start to see, okay, we, you, do have, uh, you do have these kind of temporal differences in, uh, in, in when predation is occurring. What about where predation is occurring? That's quite interesting. Uh, I gridded this into, into five kilometer bins uh, and then counted the number of tags that, uh, that had switched their predation sensor uh, at the first incidence. And un unsurprisingly to me, because I've spent months looking at these data, probably years, a lot of these predation hotspots are in the lakes. So you can see the first basin of the, the large lake here. Uh, the first basin of the second lake here. These are these are hot spots. You get predation all the way through, but but you can clearly see that those are those are two areas that are that are fairly common for predation. And and it's kind of important. And I don't want to draw any conclusions. I don't know if anybody's filming this, but but I mean our our question about whether or not the power station here is influencing uh, predation. Uh, when we compare the two lakes, one with a power station, one without a power station, they both have very high predation in this first basin. Uh, it'll, uh, that'll play into the way that we evaluate whether or not the, the power station is, is actually a mechanism driving predation spatially or temporally in this system. And then we can also start to ask questions about the individual because unlike those smolts that we're just digging out of the stomachs of trout uh, that are caught by anglers and, and called in or, or sent, uh, we got photos of. How's my time? We're at five minutes. So five minutes. <laughs> Oceans of time. Oceans of time, great. Uh, so we can actually ask which individuals are, are vulnerable to predation because we've handled all of these, these, these smolts. We've, we've measured them, we've looked at them, we've photographed them, we can measure their uh, their fin lengths and their eye widths, and we can try to figure out, okay, what, it, what about your individual traits is actually driving your probability of getting eaten by a predator? And this is maybe not the ideal data set to do that, but, but as, as an example, you can start to see how, uh, when I make a simple model of which ones have been eaten from these two species, because I didn't tell you before, but we tagged a few sam uh, uh, trout, Salmatruta, uh, as well as the salmon, you can see that there's actually quite a difference between the two species and their probability of getting predated. Trout don't seem to be eating smolts of their own species quite as much as they're eating the same. But is that behavioral differences? Is it timing differences? Uh, could be all sorts of things. But for the purposes of this talk, there seems to be a bit of a difference in the predation risk for the two species. That's quite interesting. But not only that, there seems to be a difference as you get larger, which isn't super crazy because uh, the bigger you are, the harder you are to fit into everybody's mouth. Uh, so there's a, about a 25% difference in predation risk uh, for the smallest individuals compared to the larger individuals, which is quite interesting. And, uh, and, and as we move along with using these tools, developing them a bit more, they become uh, a bit more ubiquitous in our field. We can start to test these hypotheses. Uh, we can start to develop stronger models and we can start to actually better understand what's, what's driving ecosystems in a more mechanistic way using tagging. And we were quite interested as well in what was happening in the fjord. Unfortunately, as you saw, a lot of these smolts that were tanging in the river weren't actually making it out to the fjord. They were getting eaten in the lakes. So we couldn't really figure out what was happening in here, which is an area with a lot of fish farms. So we did an experimental displacement study where we released smolts at seven different locations through the migration. And then we covered this bridge with receivers as sort of an endpoint. Uh, unsurprisingly, when you accounted for well, w I guess whether you can accounted for predation or not, the closer you were released to the bridge, the more likely you were to make it to the bridge. These individuals that were released around the corner, they didn't do so good. There's, uh, this is quite a challenging fjord to navigate. We measured water chemistry. We thought that there might be issues with, with aluminum toxicity. We thought there might be salinity problems. Uh, we couldn't really put our finger exactly on, on what was going, other than the f uh, going on, other than the fact that the farther away you were, the, the lower your probability of making it was gonna be. We modeled that, that's exactly what I said. You get, even if you're released like within 200 meters of the bridge, you had about a 50% chance of making it. So uh, not great, very problematic. Uh, five minutes. Uh. So 
tagging predators and their prey. I'm going to race through this because I was too excited about the small stuff. There's a lot of new stuff in there that I wanted to show you guys. So we also, in this lake, tagged some trout because we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to know what the predators are actually doing in the system so that we can compare and contrast a little bit? This is a beautiful sea run uh, trout that we tagged. Hey, that's me in like 2020. Uh, yeah, crazy, eh? Uh, it's, like, it's like a time machine. And, uh, and we're releasing a trout, it's got a tag in it, we have this, this lake full of receivers, uh, this is the lake around the bend, you got all these nice receivers to detect it. So we have uh, some migration data, so again, river on its side, you're hopefully getting used to this a little bit, distance to the river mouth, time, and you see we have the smolts moving out, but we also have the trout moving out, so the trout really like to hang out in the lake, some of them don't leave at all, they just live there, some of them go up, because that's what trout do, they live in the river, uh, and some of them, uh, some of them leave, some of them go out, to go out to the fjord, they migrate, they do the feeding migrations, it is interesting, they're not just sticking around completely hammering the smolts, they're, you know, some of them are leaving even though the smolts are just about to come, very inefficient, you get a lot of food if you just wait a little bit longer, so that was kind of interesting. And we also had depth tags in these, and I didn't remove these dead ones intentionally because you can see how hard it is when all you have is this tag sank to the bottom. You know, sure it died, but what actually happened to it? Was it uh, uh, was it an, an effect of tagging? Was it an effect of, of buoyancy control? You don't really know. Uh, so when you don't have a, a combined predation sensor in here, these just these are kind of mysterious. We've, but we, with the depth data, we see that the, the smolts are really bouncing almost exclusively within 10 meters of the surface, and so are the trouts. So they're over overlapping quite a lot. Uh, but we weren't satisfied with just that, so we made a really fancy model called an additive model, uh, where we fit smooths to it. Uh, and you can see that the, the predicted depth for, uh, for the, trout, the salmon smolts was actually kind of deeper than the trout were for the most part until it got a little bit later in the season. Probably that's when the flood is coming, the water's mixing more, and they start to overlap more. So uh, lots of potential for predation going on here. Uh, certainly not hard to believe that they could eat each other, or that not eat each other, but that the trout could eat the salmon in here as well. They're not really that far separated. Uh, so I'm gonna fly through uh, an otter project that we did because I still have. Minus eight minutes, no. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a few minutes. Okay, I still have a few minutes. Um, Otters are a big conflict species in Norway now. They were essentially gone for uh, decades, and conservation efforts in the 1980s led to local increases. So now there's uh, hot spots for otters in uh, Trondelag, in Sunmara, a little bit around Vestland, a little bit in the north around Tromso. I, this is a little bit biased by where people are living and recording them, I think, uh, but hard to say. You get these, these occasional photos of otters dragging salmon across the road, getting hit by cars, very sad. Uh, otters eating salmon right out of the river, people tr illegally trying to trap otters, uh, people hunting otters. Yeah, kind of kind of a wild ecosystem now all of a sudden. Uh, so we want to know exactly how much otter predation uh, is occurring in some of these rivers. We know that they're going to bring them onto land, so we couldn't use acoustic tags because of the physics of sound that doesn't transmit very far. So we had to use radio transmitters, and we added a temperature uh, sensor to them. We tagged them in the river, or on the side of the river, released them, tracked them with the radio antenna, and this is how we found a lot of them. The eyes were missing, some of the, the guts were missing. They didn't do a great job of eating the whole animal, which is quite interesting. They leave a lot of carcasses, which is actually a really important ecosystem role because it leaves a lot of food for other species that can't themselves dump, jump in the river and catch a salmon. Very cool. This is Lena Sortland. She's at uh, DTU right now doing her PhD. Uh, uh, she was a great master's student, uh, wrote this all up. And she used the temperature, uh, temperature sensors that we had uh, attached to these tags to identify the timing of predation. So if a tag was recovered on land, we could actually identify down to the hour when it had actually been eaten by an otter to figure out, uh, uh, when we figured that out basically b based on the temperature on the tag compared to temperature of the water and the temperature of the, uh, of the tag, or uh, t temperature of water and temperature of the air. You can follow Tammy the Otter on Twitter. Uh, I guess it's X now. Uh, and, and at the end of the season, we could identify the fate of all the tagged fish, number that were still in the river to spawn, number of tags that just sort of were on the bottom of the river, and number of carcasses that we found on land. Uh, one thing, a really important finding that we had was uh, 
there was a, a direct effect of predation on the spawning target in one of the two rivers. So one where the, the conflict seemed to be quite high, it actually was having a negligible effect on the overall population. In our elva, most of the fish spawned, uh, and a lot of the predation happened uh, after the spawning period. But in Cerevartal selva, there was a lot of predation before the spawning even occurred. Uh, so in Cerevartal selva, it, re it reduced the spawning target from about 95% based on the number that actually went in to 21%. Uh, and, we, and we also tested for impacts of predation on uh, targeting males versus females and, and found no difference, which was different from a, a, an older study on uh, otter predation in the UK. So we ex this project got extended for uh, several years to look at more rivers. We're using external tags now for a variety of rivers. Uh, we were in Bundal Silva this summer, uh, tagging salmon. Really cool project, really exciting. Uh, and and we're, one of the questions in the extension is going to be uh, the genetics of these fish. So we're going to look for farmed genes, the uh, evidence of introgression from farmed salmon in these individuals to look if there's any selection uh, by, by otters on fish with farmed genes, which would be very interesting. And Gustav and I were up in Svalbard. That's Gustav. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, earlier, this, earlier this year, uh, putting out some tags in Atlantic cod in this fjord that's full of whales. Uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, at predation of the, the cod based on uh, temperature uh, changes and uh, look for evidence of, of whale predation on these cod, which would be fun. So fastest conclusion ever. We can use these, pred these predation technologies to improve dem demographic models for fisheries management. Uh, estimating predation with electronic tagging fills a gap that is, is kind of inherent in a lot of these approaches. Uh, or a lot of uh, traditional fisheries approaches, and we can contribute to stronger fisheries management. Uh, this is a cool concept. Again, uh, thanks for your help with this, Gustav. Very nice paper coming up. Uh, predation and restoration. We found, based on our work with the otters in those two rivers, that, that the habitat was actually really a mediator of the predation. Why was predation so high in one river? Well, it seemed that the, the, the salmon really didn't have a lot of habitat to shelter in, so they were much more vulnerable to the predation of otters. And, and we kind of developed this into, uh, into different ways that habitat acts as an intermediary uh, in the predation landscape. So in natural landscapes, you have uh, lots of places to hide. The, the cost for an, like a predator to run between trees is, is very high. Uh, places to shelter are more abundant. Uh, in, in modified landscapes, uh, you, you can't sort of play a fun game of like, you know, spot the 10 differences between these. Uh, you, get rid of the, you get rid of the trees, all of, all of a sudden the cost of running right to the, the prey is very low, so the energetic uh, landscape changes. Uh, the shelter is lost, you, this river is channelized. Uh, f uh, there's less apparent competition, so you lose other species that the predators might target. So, so habitat restoration actually potentially is a really powerful tool for addressing predator play co prey conflicts that hasn't really been very well considered. Instead of targeting and removing predators, you may need to simply look at the habitat quality, and by improving the habitat quality, I feel fairly strongly from our, uh, a lot of our research that you can actually address predator prey conflicts. Can we understand individual vulnerabi vulnerability to predation? This is an emerging framework. I hope so. I think so. I think these tools can actually help us build a framework about what makes individuals vulnerable to predation. Uh, can we compare why some, er some individuals are eaten by predators compared to why some individuals are harvested by fisheries uh, or are harvested by hunters? I think so. Um, uh, and can we test intervention? So uh, predator control rarely works. This is a, a synthesis paper on, on whether or not removing predators actually accomplished anything for the ecosystem. Uh, it turns out that it, it rarely does. Why is that? Uh, probably because it's not the right tool for the job. So we need alternatives to deal with predator-prey conflicts. Can we use predation tagging and telemetry to test some of these interve interventions and better understand how we can resolve these conflicts when they occur? Uh, and instead of conclusions, I will take one question. All right, great. Thank you so much, Robert. It's excellent as always. All right, yes. I think one question is all we have time for, actually. Uh, do we have any? I have a great one. So when it comes to predation sensors, 
you did a sort of a controversial paper <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, do you want to tell the audience about that? No comment. <laughs> no comments. That was what Robert did was he tested <laughs> out the various producers and. Uh, no, we, so predation sensors are still developing, so there's different kinds of predation sensors that exist. Uh, I presented one of the two kinds that I work with mostly, and there was another kind that didn't work so well in our validation, and I've been told that since then it has been improved upon and works quite well, but I haven't had the opportunity to test that one. Uh, so I only talked about the specific one that I have the most experience with. Very diplomatic said. That was <laughs> really no controversy at all, it sounds like. <laughs> no controversy whatsoever. Great, Robert. Thank you so much.